this is Corinna Bench, and welcome to the My Digital Farmer podcast. In today's market, it's not enough to just grow your product. You've got to know how to sell it, too. Welcome to the My Digital Farmer podcast, where we reveal online marketing strategies and tips to help farmers like you get better and more competent at marketing. Learn how to find more customers, increase your sales, and build a strong brand for your farm. Let's start the show. Well, hey there, everyone. Welcome to the show. This is episode two of the My Digital Farmer podcast. I am your host, Corinna Bench the farmer's wife at Shared Legacy Farms. So glad you're here today. Today, we are talking about ideal customers, the ideal customer avatar. And you may be wondering, what does that even mean? And the reason I chose this topic as I'm beginning this podcast, I kind of swam out big picture and wanted to think about what should I talk about first? What are those fundamentals of marketing that I wish someone had shared with me back when I began my business? So as I shared in my last episode, episode one, I talked about how I kind of dove headfirst into the study of marketing in about 2016. I didn't know anything about marketing. I was really clueless and I was trying to run a business without that skill set. And as I began to study it and learn from mentors and take online courses and go to conferences on marketing, I began to hear certain phrases, certain concepts again and again. And now that I've got all this stuff in my head and I've been practicing it for several years, I feel like I I can kind of go up into the high altitudes and I can see the big picture items that I think are really important to understand. Kind of the, you know, the dots, if you're going to play connect the dots, the big dots that we need to know as business owners in the area of marketing. And this topic is the number one thing I think we have to wrap our head around first, because if we don't get this right, everything else in our business kind of struggles understanding who is your ideal customer. That is, I think, the most important thing that you have to know as a business owner, as a marketer, as you're building out your message, because if you get this wrong or you don't have clarity about it, your business will struggle. So you can get all of the show notes today at mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash 002. I'll be bringing up a few links as we talk today. So Kurt and I had never really thought much about this topic of who's our ideal customer. Back in 2008, we just sort of started our business and we just needed 12 customers and we were willing to take any warm body we could because we needed money, right? We needed income and we didn't know to ask this question, who is your ideal customer? Um, So why does knowing your ideal customer matter? This is a a phrase that I want you to just kind of commit to memory because it's a powerful one. If you're talking to everyone, you're talking to no one. That is something that I have seen again and again. If you're talking to everyone, you're talking to no one. We've got to know exactly who our target customer is and we speak to them. So if you don't know who your ideal customer even is, you'll just be blasting out a message about your product to everyone in the world, hoping it sticks And it'll be kind of a watered down, broad message trying to appeal to the masses. That is not how marketers work. All the great businesses and brands are very clear about who their perfect customer is. And when they build their marketing message, when they build their offers, they have that customer, ideal customer in mind and they write the message for them. So as I said, when we first started, we just needed warm bodies. Kurt and I didn't understand the importance of really understanding who our ideal customer was. And we noticed over the years uh, that some of those customers would stay in, in our CSA from year to year, but some didn't. And we kind of hovered around that you know, retention rate in the 60 percentile. But I, I discovered a pattern over time. It seemed like a certain kind of person, a certain kind of client was thriving. I mean, thriving, like it was just easy for them to use our product. I didn't even need to coach them a lot. 
Every business has a customer like this, and you do too. And in the marketing space, they have a word for this. It's called the ideal customer avatar, and the short term for this is ICA. So if you ever hear that little acronym running around, that's what it stands for, ICA, ideal customer avatar. Now, the ICA is usually um, the the person who is perfectly, ideally suited for your product. It works for them without a lot of effort. It's not hard for them. It's an easy fit. They love it. They love it even when it's broken, even when there are flaws and there are mess ups. It's, It's like they don't even see them. And they are the people who are most likely to become super fans. And here's the thing, your ideal customer, they spend a lot of money with you because they buy again and again and again because they just love your brand and everything about you. They are truly your biggest fans. So I want you to just do a little thought experiment with me here for a second. You have a lot of different kinds of customers. If you've been in business for a few years, um, you have many customers and they fall on a spectrum. Okay, I want you to kind of imagine the range of all your customers right now. Which ones of these customers, if you could clone them and replicate them and make more of them, which one of those customers would it be? What would they look like? And I want you to just take some time um, later on today to go write down the characteristics of this person that you're imagining. Maybe it's actually a real person, like they have a name, you can see their face, you see their buying behaviors, you see their attitudes, um, their values. That person is your ideal customer avatar. Now, when you become super clear on the type of customer that your product is perfect for, your job will eventually be to focus all of your marketing on attracting only them, more of them, not trying to speak to everyone and hope that some of those people on the sidelines who are kind of sort of customers will come to you too. You're really just trying to talk to your ideal customer so that more of them will find you. This is the cardinal rule of marketing. Like I said, I feel like it's the number one thing that you need to start with, that you need to understand to be a better salesperson. Identify who your ICA is. It all starts there. So why is this? Because when I study my ICA and I really understand them and and I can identify how they think, how they talk inside their head, um, what stories they tell themselves, what values they have, what behaviors, where they shop, um, what their family life is like, what an average day is like, you will start to see patterns and I can then, when I see these patterns of my ICA, I can tailor my messaging, my sales marketing pieces to attract more of them, to speak their language. This is why it's so important to get inside their head and really know them. So I want you to think about a brand that you are extremely loyal to, okay? We all have a few of them. And I want you to think about how do you feel towards that brand? I mean, how do you feel about them? How do you behave when you get around their products, when you see an advertisement for them, or you find out that a new product's being released, or you just see their logo, or you see something on social about them? How do you feel towards them? So for me, this super brand for me and my family is Lego. Now, if you were to come into my house, um, my, I have two boys that are Jed and Josiah. They are age seven and 10. So this is 2019. And they come home from school and they go into their room and they start building Legos. And they have been like this for like two years. And I think between the two of them, my boys have at least, at least a hundred Lego sets, probably more like 150. Like we have binders of all of those building manuals that we save and they're they're packed they're like three of them and this started this this fetish for lego actually started for me personally when i was young um it didn't just start with my kids when you look at my history like i personally was a lego fanatic and my brothers were always building lego so as a child 
there was this pattern that was already set, right? My brothers had this huge drawer of Legos that they pulled out from their dresser and they would just scrape through with their hands and pull and find stuff and make and make really cool things. So when I had my own kids in the back of my mind, I think I was just like, well, my kids will have that too. We will have a Lego drawer like my brothers because I loved how we played together and we made cool stuff. I have all these feelings associated with Legos, these fond memories. And this is kind of what I aspire to. So when Jed, my firstborn, was was little, I exposed him to the Duplos. I did it on purpose because I wanted him to come to love Legos, right? Like I was feeding this, this love of this product to him. And my parenting style, if you were to get to know me, I tend to be um, very hands-on, like we really don't watch a lot of television. Um, I don't let my kids play on devices very much at all. I'm very, very careful about that just because I want them to go out and work. I want them to be out in nature and, and I let them get on their devices a bit, especially as Jed's getting older. But I, my focus was like, no, we're going to play and we're going to manipulate things. We're going to be creative. So this was, you know, a, t- a toy that appealed to what I value as a parent. I want my kids to do stuff, to be imaginative and to be creative. Now, other friends of mine who with kids, they, you know, they're spending their money on sports. Like, oh, my kid's on a sport team. They're doing soccer and basketball and football. Um, My child has yet to ever, either of them have never been on a sport team and they never really showed interest, but I would, I would justify, here's what I would spend money on, Lego kits. And this is how I would justify it in my head. Like I would spend $150 at a time for this fancy Technic Lego kit. And in my mind, I would say, well, this is my version of sports for my kid, right? This is how I'm training him to be a mechanical genius. And we once spent $350 on a kit for Christmas for Jed that was this super duper kit with all these automatic parts. Do you listen? Can you hear the passion in my voice? Like, I want to buy the bucket wheel excavator kit. Like, that's just how psycho I am. And we have the Lego EV3 robot. And we have, we've been on a Lego robotics team and we made it to state. Like, we are bought in to this brand. I bet I have spent about $5,000 on Legos. So I tell you this story because I am Lego's dream customer. I am their ideal customer, not just because I'm buying a lot of their products, but because I am bought into the brand and what it stands for. I am, I am all about the values that, that they're all about. I mean, their mission is to build the, you know, the future builders of America. Well, not just America, the world, right? So they're all about like raising up children to, to be adults that will like contribute to society and in this creative kind of way. So if they're going to make something, I'm going to look for it on the website. I'm going to buy it. I'm going to be a repeat buyer. So how did Lego do this to me? How did they turn me into a prolific buyer and lifelong customer and brand ambassador? All right, that is the question that kind of stumps me and fascinates me at the same time. And here's kind of as I thought about that question, I realized that I already was like a brand ambassador for Lego. And it started when I was five, right? Like this has been pushed into me at a young age. And what Lego has done is they've just found me at the right time once I had children of my own and they fanned the flame that was already there. They put offers in front of me. They created theme kits that spoke to my child. They fed this idea that imagination is what they're all about. It's the transformation of my child. It's not just another toy. Lego has grown my son not just given them a toy, and it has also grown with my son. So that was a very long explanation about my my passion for Legos. Thanks for bearing with me. But I'm telling you this story as an example because we all have brands like that that have captivated us, where we have become their ideal customer. 
And our brand, our farm can do the same thing with our ICA. In fact, we must, we have to follow the same strategy. We have to find that person that's ideally suited um, for our particular product and then put offers in front of them and fan the flame and make sure they know we're here and they will come just because they're already wired to value what it is that you value. If you resonate with them through your messaging, they will find you and they will come. Can you imagine if Lego just chased down every person in the world and just threw advertising dollars at everyone, um, even people who weren't necessarily mechanically minded or just weren't into the whole building thing, um, that would be foolish, right? They have a very targeted audience that they're after. Lego is at its best when it's doing this strategy in front of its ICA. It's making most of its money. Lego is making most of their money on their ICA, on the people like me who are spending $5,000 a pop. So in your marketing, you have to spend your energy crafting offers and messaging that's going to talk to your ICA, not to everyone. Because remember, when we talk to everyone, we talk to no one. Now, this, of course, also means that not everyone is your ICA. I want to just pause and I want to say that again because I want this to sink in. Not everyone is your ICA. So as much as we are ready and willing to attract customers with our message, we must also be willing to repel. That was a very strange concept when I first heard it, but I have seen it again and again now that I've really embraced this idea of going after my ICA with my messaging. We cannot speak to everyone. When you make decisions about what you're going to write on your flyer or how you're going to word things on your website or what images you're going to use in a Facebook post and how you're going to talk about stuff, you've got to make a decision about who you're speaking to. And if I'm going to choose a customer that I'm going to try and attract, it's going to be my ICA, right? And that means, therefore, that it's not going to talk to the same way in people who are just sort of ho-hum about what I have to offer. I'm not trying to speak to people that, that will never want to buy what I have uh, in, in an effort to try and change their mind. That's not how this works. So we have to be willing with our messaging to repel those customers who are not an ideal fit, who will never be an ideal fit, no matter what we do, um, as much as we are willing to attract the right customer with our message. So how do you find this ICA of yours? How do you identify them? How do you zone in on them? Well, the answer is you need to research them. <laughs> in fact, all of the big companies who have those advertising dollars behind them, you better believe they have teams of people that are doing market research because they know this principle. We put our message in front of our ideal customer, not in front of everyone. So let's find out who our ideal customer is based on the patterns of buying and, and researching you know, who, who our current customers are so that we can continue to put uh, to find more customers and put those offers in front of them. So researching your ideal customer, um, there is a huge process behind this. And I have lots of different strategies um, for how to do this. But one of the tools that I want to share with you is what I call my ICA worksheet. And I'm going to actually, it's a one page download. I'm going to put it in the show notes, mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash 002. You just click on the link and you'll be able to download it. And this is a one-page sheet that kind of breaks down the different categories that I think you need to research and find information out on. Okay, so there's a whole section on that worksheet that's just about demographics, right? So that's kind of where we first go when we think about, oh, customer research. We're like, oh, yeah, I need to figure out are they male or female? What's the typical age? Um, how many kids do they have? Uh, what's their income level, what's their education level, like those are kind of the typical things that we think of when we think of doing customer research, the basic demographics. But if you stop there, you miss the mark because that is not where the gold is when it comes to really marketing and putting your message out there. 
Where you're really going to find the gold is when you mine for information about your, your customer's feelings, okay? All the feeling words. So this is where you do research to answer questions like, what is my customer's problem that relates to my brand? Like, why did they seek me out? Why did they come to me to try and find something? What What's that exterior problem and that inner problem that's driving that exterior problem? What's keeping them up at night as it relates to my brand? What are the values that they share? Like, remember me with Lego, like I am all about um, just building imagination and being cre- creative. So that's something that resonates with me when I see Lego and they talk about how that's a big deal for their brand. Um, what about like the desired transformation? So what is your customer, your ideal customer want from you? Not just the product, but like, what do they want that product to do for them? What's that end result that's going to make them feel like this was a successful transaction? Um, What are their goals? What's their average day like right now? And how does it get better because they're using your product, right? Really understanding that, getting into their head. Why have they come to you? What are their objections to your product as it stands right now? What do you have to convince them of? This is all stuff that customer um, marketing consultants will go and do research on because that is the information that they use to write their website copy, to put an advertisement for the television together, to uh, put words together and, and pick out the right image for a Facebook ad, for instance. So this worksheet, which you can get at mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash 002, that's the show notes, um, that weird worksheet is going to kind of lay out all those different categories and just give you a starting point for knowing, okay, these are the things that I need to try and figure out. Now, there are several ways that you can research your ideal customer avatar. Now, the biggest one that I recommend is doing a survey and interviewing your actual best customers. So back in uh, 2016, 2017, I created a, uh, an end of year survey for my uh, CSA customers. And in that survey was the first time I'd ever written the survey questions differently. Um, I used to just write yes or no questions, a lot of factual stuff. Um, this time I put together a survey that had awesome questions that were really designed to get at some of these answers that are on that ICA worksheet. And the results were just amazing because when you have 400 customers like I do and, you know, a little bit more than half of them respond, you do see patterns in their responses. So I think a well-constructed survey is a great way to see some of these patterns and to literally see the copy, the phrases, the stories they tell that show up again and again, and you can lift those out and put them on your website, put them on your flyers. If you're going to, if you've only got so much space on a flyer, on a brochure, on a Facebook ad, like you've got to be really selective about how to use that real estate, right? So why not put the things that your current avatar talks about all the time in that real estate, because that's what's probably going to resonate with other people like your customer avatar. So I really, I'm a big believer in surveys. I also did um, customer customer interviews on the telephone. And I here's the thing, I interviewed um, my best customers. I didn't interview the ones that didn't like my product. Um, I did t- get surveys from them. I wanted to hear what they said too, but I'm really trying to focus on my perfect buyer, the ones who loved me no matter what. And those were the people that I got on the phone with and I just had a conversation with them and asked a lot of these similar questions, but we went even deeper. And I got a really good understanding of why they were with me and what things were like before they bought from my CSA. So those are kind of the two big ways that I recommend. If you haven't ever surveyed your customers, if you have never um, called your customers, I really think you only need to call about 10 of them and have a good half hour conversation. I think that that will give you a ton of ideas and clarity about who your ideal customer is and how they tick. Now, when we started um, researching our ICA, everything shifted. I mean, it just completely changed the scope of how we did business because first of all, I learned what mattered most to them. And in some cases, it was different than what I thought. Like I had this idea 
of what I thought was important to my customer. And then when I actually talked to them and saw patterns, I was like, well, some of that's important, but here's some things that were brought up that were like more important. And so that helped me with kind of my messaging, what I call messaging hierarchy. Um, I started talking about some, some of those things that were brought up a lot more than I used to. It's almost like they got put on the top of the page as opposed to, you know, bullet number five. Um, but I also figured out what wasn't important to my customers because there were some things that I thought were a big deal and it ended up being that it wasn't. Like I thought health was a really huge deal. And although it was mentioned, it wasn't the most important reason that people were joining an organic farm. They really wanted to be a part of um, supporting a local farmer and they were all about really great, fresh quality vegetables. These are foodies, people who love to eat and wanted unusual variety and cool stuff. Wanted to kind of experiment and have fun in their kitchen. It wasn't really so much about, oh, I wanna have a healthy lifestyle. That was kind of a side bonus, but that helped me understand that's not what I should be pushing in my messaging. So it just gave me clarity about how to talk about my brand when I am on social, when I am putting things on my website, when I am talking with a customer face to face. When you um, research your customers, you do these surveys, you follow some other research methods, it just becomes so much clearer. Now, there are a lot of other ways that you can research your customer, especially if you're a first-time farmer and you don't have any customers yet. Um, I'm actually working on a mini workshop on how to uh, research your ideal customer. And if you're interested in learning more about how you can access that workshop, you can go to sharedlegacyfarms.com forward slash ICA. Um, that hasn't been released yet, but it should be um, by, the, by the time summer begins, I should have that. If you're interested in taking that workshop, I think it's a really helpful process for how to um, actually learn these research methods that will help you find out details about your customer avatar. You'll be able to find that link in the show notes as well, mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash 002. So if I could go back and do one thing over, it would be getting clear on who my ideal customer was. I, I'm serious. Like out of all the things that I have learned in the last two and a half years in marketing, this is the one thing if I could do things over again, or if I could go back to year one or two, I would do this. I would do interviews. I would call people on the phone. I would grill my best customers and try to get inside their heads. Um, it was about year seven when we finally started this process. And that's really when our business began to thrive. Uh, when we created a product, when we tweaked our product and the messaging of our product so that it truly served our customer. I want you to think about that. Wouldn't we want to know how we can best serve our customers? I mean, isn't that what this is all about? We're not just growing produce or, you know, growing flowers or whatever it is that you're doing as in agriculture for the sake of growing. We're, we're doing this because we actually want to serve our customer. We want to help our customer. We want to meet a need for them, right? I mean, I hope that's why you're doing this. And so, if that is our ultimate goal, you know, we always have to be looking at how do I then tweak this product so that I can meet the need of my customer? And shouldn't we know our target customer so well that we can understand immediately what they need so that we can make those pivots? So I hope you are getting the message today. Stop trying to attract everyone to your farm because not everyone is an ideal customer. Find your ideal customer, know who they are, understand how they think, get inside their head, and start talking to them and only them. All right, so I want to encourage you to download that worksheet, which you can uh, get in the show notes at mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash 002. And if you enjoyed this podcast, would you please subscribe to the podcast and help get the word out to other people? Uh, let me know what you think. And I also just want to make sure you know about my Facebook community. I want to welcome you and invite you to be a part of that. If you're a farmer and you want to come in and talk about marketing stuff with other farmers, just do a search on Facebook for CSA Marketing Discussion Group and you'll find us request access and I um, will take a look and let you in. 
All right, our next episode next week is going to be talking all about another topic that I think you really need to understand big picture as you're studying kind of the fundamentals of marketing. We're going to be talking about traffic. And no, I'm not talking about the cars and the trucks on the interstate. I'm talking about something else called traffic, where um, how do we go about finding people to come into our web so that we can share our product with them. And we're going to talk about all the different ways that we warm up this traffic and get them into our funnel. Thanks for joining me today, you guys. Remember, head to the show notes, mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash 002 for all the links and details that we talked about today. And I can't wait to see you next week on the My Digital Farmer podcast. Thanks for tuning in.